Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Szymon Kaliski, and I'm going to talk about Inkface, a programmable ink project from Ink and Switch. We work on it during spring and summer of this year, together with Joshua Horowitz and James Lindenbaum. So uh, starting with some context for the project. We have a couple of hypotheses that inform this work. First one is that pen and paper is a great brain world interface. So as a species, we have evolved with a lot of dexterity in our hands. And pencil and paper is a great object to think with in Seymour Papert sense. So using paper allows us to externalize our thoughts and even take a step back and think about our own thinking. Secondly, we believe that spreadsheets are really great. They enable these new forms of thinking, working with numbers, modeling scenarios. They are also, as we all know, like great and user programmable tools. And we want more tools that allow us to think in new ways. But there's also a cost to them. This formality of two-dimensional cells is not always helpful. And not every problem maps well to this metaphor. Thirdly, we believe that and the fidelity of the tool has to match the maturity of the idea that you're working with. So if you have just a rough idea of what you're trying to accomplish a sketch, having precise tool can be counterproductive. So personally, I often get caught up in making sure all my Figma frames have exact margins and are aligned uh, instead of focusing on their content. And finally, in the space of digital ink programming it or with it is, is very unexplored. And finally, this is also where interactive computing has started with famous projects like Sketchpad or Grail. And we believe that the tablet form factor can introduce this new wave of expressive dynamic tools. So what did we make? What is, what is Inkbase? On a surface level, Inkbase is a plain digital notebook. So you can draw on it, and you can select and move things around. And to access these secondary functionalities, uh, like a selection mode, we use quasi modes after Jeff Raskin. So holding your finger on the page becomes a non logic mode. But beneath the familiar stylus interface, Inkbase allows you to build dynamic ink sketches. So let's look at a common use case of pen and paper notebooks, making a to-do list. And let's imagine how we can make it dynamic for example, through changing the color of completed tasks. So how can you build this? To start with, each stroke is a dynamic object with a set of reactive properties. So if you, for example, change the stroke property, the color of the rendered ink changes as well. And the UI of the inspector pane, or, or do we even have an inspector pane, is kind of incidental to this project and not its focus. So. We're sure that this is not the right approach to work with stroke properties and programming the system in general. We just used it as a crutch to get to other ideas. Ideas like that these properties can be weaved together to create reactive data flows, just like in a spreadsheet. So here I'm calculating a sign of the object's Y position, turning it into hue saturation brightness representation. And I can then put that into the field property to get this beautiful dynamic colorful star. So coming back to our to-do list, the final piece of the puzzle is use of spatial queries for communicating between objects. So we can test if there's ink inside of that sketchy rectangle that I made, and based on that change its color. And this is basically how the demo is implemented. We check if there's ink in, inside of that rectangle, and if there is, we change the color of the items to the right of it. So now that we know the basics of the prototype, what can you make in an environment like that? What can Inkbase do? So let's start with an educational setting. Imagine explaining to a friend how logic gates work. So you can start by showing how the basic ones behave. And also from these basic behaviors, you can start building more complex schematics. So here we're explaining how AND gate, AND gate works by building them from two NANDs. So again, how does that work? Each of these gates queries for what's on the top left, bottom left, and to the right of it. So the left items become inputs, and the right ones outputs. So we can, for example, inspect the state of the input to see how it changes when we tap on it. 
the output nodes on the right can be written to the same spatial interface. So we're querying for them and then running a small piece of code to run Boolean end on the inputs and write the output to the output node. So we just make a made a basic end gate. And this is basically how the whole expert example was implemented. But there's more things you can make in Inkbase. One of them that we played with was this idea of sketching math. So imagine trying to understand derivatives through sketching different function shapes. So here we're doing first and second order derivative from the little arc that we drew. And we can of course make any shapes on that uh, chart. And we can imagine running through more complex case. So for example, to explain where a sign shape comes from, we can map the Y coordinate of the intersection of the line and the circle, plot it on the shape on the bottom left, which gives us sign. And uh, derivative of that is cosine shot on the bottom right. Inkbase can also be helpful in sketching out UI elements. So here we're playing around with the tab component, playing with the number of tabs, and controlling the margin widths with this little hand-drawn slider that was created ad hoc for the task at hand. And on the other side, we could offload some mental bookkeeping tasks like counting how long the current streak is in our workout tracker. So we've built this prototype and, and we lived it in for a while uh, and we learned a couple of things. And our observations are, are mostly feelings, but, but I think they are important nonetheless. So firstly, uh, dynamic hand-drawn strokes feel very good, especially if you look at them through this lens of fidelity of the tool should reflect the maturity of the idea. We believe that sketchy thoughts require sketchy tools. Secondly, and, and this is kind of pushing the choir here, Alive systems are great. There's, there's no compile and run loop. Ink base is always there, alive responding. That feels good too. Thirdly, computation through reactive spatial queries was a great learning for this canvas-based system. So instead of for asking uh, for things by abstract IDs or from the global object, some sort of environment, instead we ask for what's to the left, to the right, top and bottom. That, that just feels distinctively different and also correct. And finally, something that we didn't really achieve, the not feeling like programming feeling. So the goal with this is to not have to switch from your sketching hat to your programmer hat when you want to add dynamics to the system you're working with. And Inkbase, we believe, sometimes gestures at this space. For example, when you work with tangible embodied objects instead of abstract symbols. But this is not enough. And I really believe that this space is worth exploring further. And now to open questions, our known unknowns. We, we don't know if, if this half declarative, half imperative reactive programming model is, is correct for an Inkbase like system. So we used a homegrown list in a reactive data flow model and their activity feels correct, but the language and, and the model choices were based on what was easy for us to implement. So the whole system design needs to be revised. Uh, now we have a bit of a better understanding and grasp of use cases and mental models within the tools. And, and this is basically a follow-up for this project would be figuring out uh, what is a better programming model for the system. How to work with compound objects. So. Most of the drawings that you make uh, when, when sketching are made of multiple strokes. So you pick your pencil up and down again while working on a single object. And we have just no idea how grouping and programming of or with compound objects should work like. Uh, we tried a couple of approaches, but, but we didn't find anything satisfactory in this project. Another thing that you very quickly want to do is, is to create new, object, new objects programmatically and related to this is this question of computer voice. So how much ink is left by the sketcher, the, the user of the system, and how much or none is added by the computer? So for example, asking the computer to draw a vector shape or a text overlay. We just don't know what a good balance here is. In some examples, as you saw, we added vector graphics on top of the sketches, like in the logic gates example. And in some other ones, the computer modifies strokes made by a human, like in the workout tracker. And finally, 
we often want the same or similar behaviors to be applied to similarly looking objects or to query for similarly looking things. And we just couldn't find a good set of understandable heuristics for how that should work like. So that's it for InkBase. Uh, thank you for listening. I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions we have the time for. And, and if you're working on something similar, we always love to share our learnings. And, and if you work, want to work on the next phase of this research, with or without us, feel free to, to contact us. So reach out to, to hello at inkandswitch.com for, for this project. Uh, project. Um, thank you. Wow, that's a great talk. Um, so I can take questions now. If you're in the room, you have a question, raise your hand. And if you're on Zoom, you can raise your hand on Zoom or you can ask on Discord. So I have a, I have a question to kick it off. What is the scope of sketchy thoughts you wanna be able to think? Because you know, if you're asking about what is this programming model that we want, I guess you'd have to kind of define the domain of what kinds of miniature programs you're trying to make here. Yeah, that's a very good question. And and I don't think I have clear answers for anything. I, I kind of think this is almost a chicken egg problem to figure out what you can think with the system. You need to build the system, but you need to build the system, you need to figure out. So you see the the the, the, the dependence. Like we we hope this is like the first maybe flip around <laughs> the circle. And we found some things that, that allow you to kind of think through the object you have. And that, that feels like a thread worth pulling, but there's so little to be, uh, that I can tell about this because it's so like fresh that, that it's, um, it's hard to answer this question any better. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I think it needs more, more work on to, to figure out like what exactly is that for and how you use it, how it impacts your, your work. So we're really after this, this collaboration with the tool uh, and that requires like this this feedback loop to happen. Yeah, well, it's definitely super inspiring. I think, man, could programming just feel as natural as sketching something on my notepad? That would be so wonderful. Uh, Jess, do you have a question? Yeah, I, I I wrote this down about halfway through the talk, and I'm not sure it's very relevant now that I'm at the end of it and kind of saw what you guys did with it, which is really cool, really impressive. Um, the uh, I was thinking about can you programmatically sort of upgrade the fidelity of a prototype? Like sometimes you actually, I, I don't know if you, if you remember Balsamic back in the day, it basically had like two modes. It had like sketchy mode and then like hard line mode. Uh, and mm -hmm. you could toggle between the two and they felt really different. They really did. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I don't know, it, it almost feels like with the representation of the objects, you could like toggle between uh, shapes that are uh, perfect and then sketchy shapes. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. It's something we talked about internally for, for a long time. Like we, we don't think Inkbase is it, uh, but the imagined future would be clear progression where you stay with the same or similar tools and work on the same material. So you can start with a sketchy idea, add some dynamicism, and then figure out that later you want to polish it into like higher fidelity things. So you move fluidly through the space. But this, as you can see, is a lot of hand waving at this point. <laughs> yeah, kind so of like how a, about this, but like, yeah, yeah, it's not better. <laughs> like a like how a painting, an artist often starts out with like a, an underlayment sketch, and then they layer on layers over time yes. until you finally get to that final um, the final product. And the the underlying sketches are completely gone; like you can't see them anymore. But they started there. Yeah. All right, we have time for a, few, a couple more questions. If you're in the room, you can just raise your hand. I'll bring you the microphone. Maybe this is an unanswerable question, but uh, you said you want to make it not feel like programming. How do you do that? <laughs> Yeah, or give what's, us what's uh, like what's like what's like for more decades. Did, <laughs> yeah, or like what's one thing you did that you said, oh, I didn't that maybe it wasn't a lot of programming, but it was something you did that said, oh, that didn't feel like programming, even though I yeah. thought it would. Like one time. Yeah, we have we have some we have some intuitions about that. Like I, I and I, these are this might be more of my personal intuitions that like the, the groups so 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 bear that in mind. But 
I, I think there's a difference with working with, and something I wanted to touch on in, in the talk, um, working with abstract symbols and abstract ideas for things versus asking for them spatially. So there's a difference for finding all the strokes to the right versus you know all the ones like or writing typing one dimensional code that queries for something and returns an array of things like that feels different it's kind of hard to describe but you're working with embodied real representation of the object and interacting with with it you can see both of them at the same time versus working with this abstract code that you need to play in your head to see the results and um, that is one of those feelings um, and i hope there's more uh, we're, we're just ramping up on a new research project that like tries to dig up in, in, into this a little bit more. Uh, one of the ideas we have there is, for example, how can you represent iteration in a visual manner that is not a for loop, but something that you can actually see on the screen as where the idea is the same, but you're working with the tangible constructs, not abstract things. Yeah, um, send me an email later. There's a very, very old programming by demonstration system that uh, mm. has kind of gotten lost. Um, I haven't seen it cited very much, but they actually did do something where they had iteration in a very visual awesome. way that, that I appreciated. Yeah, thank you. I I should send an email. I can't remember what it was. I'll have to look it up. So that's why you should send me an email. Uh, any more <laughs> questions? I think we have time for one more. Well, thank you very much. That was a, a very inspiring end to, to our live workshop today.